All right. All right. We're good. All right, good. All right, thank you everyone. Um, sorry again for the late start. So welcome, my name is Maggie Sherwinski from the Active Transportation Alliance and welcome to our uh, our trail, Chicagoland Trail webinar series. Uh, today, we will be learning about what is being done to improve the trail network in Chicago's south side. And we'll be focusing on five trails. Uh, so with that, um, welcome again. So we're recording this. Uh, this webinar and we'll be sharing slides and recordings with everyone who registered afterwards and it will be on our YouTube channel. You can use the chat box if you have any questions for the panelists um, throughout the webinar and we'll address those questions at the very end. Uh, closed captioning is available if you need it, so please feel free to enable it. And, uh, and also stay tuned for other webinars that we have in this series will be our next uh, series will be in August and September most likely and we'll be covering a variety of other trails including um, the Weber Spur, a new trail in Will County, Old Plank Road Trail, East Branch to Page River Trail, and the North Shore Channel Trail. So um, one last thing we just wanted to make sure that you are all aware of and have saved the date for our big fundraiser of the year, uh, Bike the Drive, fifth third Bike the Drive. It is Sunday, September 3rd. And it's uh, a day when DuSable Lakeshore Drive is closed to cars, and it's for bikes only in the morning. And it's a great event, um, very, very, um, uh, it's worth going if you've never been, and as well as if you've been before. So we hope to see you there. Um, and you can register at bikethedrive.org. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Alex, who is going to uh, provide more, uh, a little overview about the five trails that will be covered and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Maggie. As Maggie mentioned, I am Alex Perez. I am an advocacy manager at Active Trends. And if you look at the map, we just have a visual for showing the locations of the five trails that we'd be going to talk about. And something to note is that three of them are east to west connectors and two of them are north to south connectors. And another thing to point out as well, too, is that three of them are going to be brand new trails coming to the south side and two of them are Existing trails, the Active Trans continues to advocate for improvements, upgrades, and uh, maintenance happening to the Major Taylor Trail and the Burnham Greenway. So with the Bronzeville Trail, um, the task force has been advocating to convert the abandoned Kenwood L uh, line embankment into a two-mile elevated trail. Uh, the Angle Grow Greater Englewood has been leading charge to develop the Englewood Nature Trail, which had which will develop uh, convert a vacant rail corridor as well into a almost two mile linear park for residents to enjoy, uh, foster improved food access and to use uh, connect to connect deeper with nature. And the Lake Calumet Trail, um, this has been with the Active Transportation Alliance and Epstein on behalf of the Illinois International Port District to study the feasibility of a multi-use path over the Lake Calumet to better connect the neighborhoods and the uh, big march to the Pullman National Monument and many other destinations in the South Side. And uh, the other two are the Burnham Green, uh, Major Taylor Trail. So with the Friends of the Major Taylor Trail, they've been advocating for the continued development of the trail, which is about seven miles from the Dan Ryan Woods south to Whistler Woods and includes a variation of pavement uh, from On Street to Pave. Uh, segments and the Burnham Greenway is uh, runs along a former railroad corridor that slices through the southeast side and Chicago and uh, neighboring suburbs. So there are plans to extend uh, and connect the two segments that have a two, five, two and a half mile gap to a continuous 11 mile segment of a trail. Next slide. And uh, quickly just uh, introducing our speakers. Uh, first, we'll, uh, Tim Gustafson. Gustafson from F9 Engineering will kick us off with the Lake Calumet Trail, followed by Brenda Dixon with the Major Taylor Trail Keepers and Friends of the Major Taylor Trail. Uh, then Ben Haller with the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highway, followed by uh, Boiza uh, Itaji with Grow Greater Englewood, and uh, finishing it off with John Adams from the Bronzeville Trail Task Force. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and I will hand it off to Tim to get us started. 
All right, thank you, Alex, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy to be here, and thank you for inviting me to speak on this. Uh, my name is Tim Gustafson. I'm a project manager at Epstein, uh, and we were working with the Active Transportation Alliance and the Illinois International Port District on the Lake Calumet Trail Feasibility Study. So in the interest of time, I'm going to advance to the next slide, please, and give you an overview of where we are talking about. Uh, so for those of you not terribly familiar with Lake Calumet, uh, it is located on the city's southeast side. There's a map here that Active Trans prepared, uh, which we were gracious to include in the report that identifies Lake Calumet as being just east of the Bishop Ford Expressway um, and roughly bounded by 111th Street near the north side, 122nd Street and 130th Street on the south side. Uh, as I mentioned, Bishop Ford to the west and Torrance Avenue to the east. So you can see where this is located. This image just kind of shows you what the existing condition looks like today. Next slide, please. So there has been a little bit of revision for those of you who had been following this feasibility study during its uh, development. And so I wanted to just clarify here that this is the preferred alignment that came out of this process. Um, some of you may have seen that we were considering going over the top of the lake, uh, down through the middle of this hammerhead. Uh, so as it stands, I want you all to be able to see that this is where we landed in the final report to give you an idea of what we are talking about in terms of an actual trail facility. Uh, you will note on this page, uh, we are choosing to connect on Port District property in the northwestern corner of your map. That shows the entrance drive to the golf course and this trailhead would begin right around there. Uh, the reason we chose to do this is we had been in conversations with IDOT on several occasions and CDOT during the development of this study and are fully aware that CDOT and IDOT are working on separate projects that are near and related to this project kind of outside of the port district's purview. So for the purposes of our study, we chose to begin and end where we could, and then IDOT and CDOT are both fully aware of this plan and coordinating on their plans for improvements to 111th Street for each of their respective pieces. So if there are questions on that, I can answer them later on. But once you get onto the property, it's all port district from there. And this shows a combination of trails that are traveling at grade on the ground, as well as trails on bridges or boardwalk structures uh, near and along the open water. Um, on the eastern side of the lake, you can see what appears to be a trail loop. Uh, this was an optional trail loop for those who are actually out for biking purely for the purposes of enjoying the outdoors. Uh, so this provides the port district with the optional ability to come up with two different trails, surface types, things of that nature. And this shows you roughly where they would be located should the port district choose to pursue that. Last major feature on this map that I want to highlight is getting up and over Stony Island Avenue on the east side of your map. Um, there's a railroad track that runs parallel to Stony Island, so in coordination with the Norfolk Southern. The best way to provide a high quality, low stress facility for walking and biking is to go up and over and avoid that entirely. So this shows a bridge rising up, clearing across and coming down to land in the entrance drive to Big Marsh Park over on the east side. So when considering the connectivity for this particular trail, we wanted to have it somewhere to start and end, um, both in comfortable facilities in Big Marsh on the east and on IDOT and CDOT facilities that are much longer in the future over on the west. Uh, so that's what this map is showing, and I will move on to the next slide, please. As part of this process, um, we had a lot of collaboration and coordination with various community groups, and many thanks to the Active Transportation Alliance for leading that effort. Uh, this is just a, a, a brief list of the agencies who were involved during the development of this study, um, and countless additional individuals, as well as a couple of extra webinars that the Active Transportation Alliance helped put on talking about this um, and a majority of this engagement had to happen virtually as much of the study was being done during the pandemic uh, so very much appreciate all of the participation from these groups and I apologize in advance if there is an organization not listed on this uh, that they know we're involved in our, um, in our efforts so thank you very much to everybody who's listed here next slide please as part of what we heard, uh, we wanted to make sure we, we achieved the following items when looking at the feasibility study. So in engaging with the public, we learned that people are most interested in seeing things like benches, overlook points, some wayfinding and directional signage, landscaping, interpretive signage and lighting, um, and that we were seeking to provide the benefits listed here on this slide while also addressing the concerns and barriers, making sure that a trail like this would be safe 
uh, that the areas that need to be well lit are well lit. Um, and this is a unique case in that we wanted illumination and lighting for safety purposes, but we also wanted to be respectful of the natural environment. So the concerns for that are kind of baked into the feasibility studies recommendations for what kind of lighting, how and where. Uh, additionally, um, people wanted to make sure that a trail of this type is pretty far away from a whole bunch of other things, so we need to know who's going to maintain it uh, and will it be respectful of the environment. Uh, similar concerns is people did not want unsafe connections at the beginning or end of the trail, like I detailed on the previous slide, and that if you're out here, will you feel safe using the space, not just safe from traffic violence, but other things that may make you feel uncomfortable. Um, last but not least is the importance about whether or not this trail will get built and who will know about it. Uh, and that's actually part of the ongoing campaign to advocate that Active Trans has been pursuing. Alex, did you have something to add? I wanted to pause there just in case I heard you ask something. Nope, you're good. All right, next slide, please. So we did a lot of uh, review on certain levels of impacts and where we might experience them. I've chosen to highlight the types of environmental impacts that I consider to be probably the most critical, although all of these are probably important, is we needed to understand whether or not any elements of the trail would involve putting fill in the floodplain, in which case you need to offset those stormwater needs for every cubic foot or as seen here, CF shown on the table. So various different pieces of alignments did have to involve that and we needed to document how much in each case because that would help us to make a determination on what we would select. Similarly, we had to identify any acreage of wetlands that may be impacted for construction of a trail of this type. I would say fill in floodplain is negotiable. Wetlands impact is a big no-no. You want to minimize or eliminate that entirely wherever you can. Uh, another unique feature was whether or not certain trail elements may involve actually changing the size or shape of the lake. Uh, because the port district does need to keep this operable for various reasons, we needed to actually document to the extent, would we be affecting golf course operations? Would we be affecting shipping operations or any intermodal impacts? So in each segment that we looked at, we determined whether or not that was going to be a problem. This is meant to just be a very high level summary of what that table impacts look like. So I wanted to show that to you here. Next slide, please. This looks at the other segments, same information. And as you can see, some of these sections were more impactful than others. Uh, and it was important for us to document that in each case. So this is just a continuation. I didn't have time to walk through each of the key sections of the map, but this corresponds roughly with the geographic location from west to east. Next slide. And then as everyone is always interested in learning is how much does something like this cost? So we chose to do a very simplified table here for today's presentation to show you that the majority of the trails cost actually does involve a bridge. Uh, it's quite a lot, um, but I think that, and as you all may agree, when you're advocating for safe, comfortable, accessible facilities that everyone can benefit, we should not be shying away from how much these things cost. We should be looking for opportunities to find ways to pay for them. So, this identifies approximately what share of the cost involves the trail on the ground or grade, how much is on a dock or a boardwalk, a bridge, and then the additional enhancements that we kind of lumped together. I also wanted to do that just to make sure like things like roof work and things like that have a home. So the constructed cost is just under $11 million. And then we estimate what the additional cost for implementation may be needed to take that on. And then as I always want to caution, whenever you're doing a study at this level and you don't have super specific data, we like to put a nice conservative contingency on top of that, knowing that the cost may rise or fall by as much as that 35% number that you're seeing in the middle of your screen. So all in, beginning to end, start to finish, constructed and designed, this project would estimate to be around $18.3 million. Next slide, please. And with the balance of my time, I wanted to show you a few images. Um, some enhancements were proposed for this area. So when considering the trail and its loop, uh, there was a request to look at a wildlife viewing area near the southeastern corner of the lake. And on the next slide, please, you'll see images of some of the enhancements we're looking to do. So on the left, you'll see an image showing what a proposed wildlife viewing area could look like. And then a very uh, high level, but still relatively specific cost estimate for what that might cost to enhance. So this would be an additional $800,000 of enhancements so that people that are not actively walking or biking can still enjoy the outdoors in this location. Uh, this is just an artistic rendering of what that might entail. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then only for my last two slides, I wanted to leave you with a few images by showing how this trail might look from various locations. So we wanted to detail kind of what that bridge on over Stony Island uh, Avenue might look like. Uh, rising and clearing. You'll notice we chose to illustrate it this way so that we can make clear this goes high enough to allow trucks and trains to pass under this. And that would be a requirement for IDOT as well as the Norfolk Southern Railroad in this location. And they were instrumental in telling us what those clearance requirements might need to be. Uh, images on the bottom show some more of the natural areas. And then I have four more images on the final slide, if you'll move to that, just showing some additional detail on what these different amenity spaces might look like or how the trail might interact with the open water itself. So one of the exciting things about this is if you have areas where you're dealing with low lying or um, wetland areas or you're trying to reduce your impact, um, we explore the feasibility of certain boardwalk style construction, which is not too different than some of the uh, Chicago Park District pier facilities that you may be familiar with here in the city. So happy to answer questions. I'm going to move on to the last slide and thank everybody for your time. And uh, with that, I will turn over the balance of that to Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, so next up, we've got Dr. Brenda Dixon from the Major Taylor Trail Keepers and Friends of the Major Taylor Trail. And we also have a special guest, Peter Taylor, who might be popping into the presentation as well. But Brenda, I'll let you take it over. Yeah, and I, th I think Peter's going to be the one answering questions most most likely, but we'll see. And I think Anne was, couldn't get in. But uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, first of all, for giving me this platform to talk about our beloved trail. Um, I'm Brenda Dixon. I am a newly retired educator. Um, and uh, we have two different organizations that work literally in, in lockstep with each other. Uh, Friends of the Major Taylor Trail, you see the board uh, on the screen, and then Major Taylor Trail Keepers, which basically is just the 501c organization that it, we, we, we use our funds based on the wishes of the Friends of the Major Taylor Trail. Next slide, please. Um, we have a website, uh, majortaylortrailkeepers.org. Please go there, browse around. We try to give blogs and posts and updates to keep people aware of what's happening on the trail. Uh, both organizations are represented there. Next slide. Um, so wh where is the Major Taylor Trail? It's the far southwest west quadrant of Chicago, and it ends with the border between Chicago and Riverdale. Uh, it crosses, it was five different wards. I'm not sure if it's still five wards that it crosses through now that they've redistricted, but it literally runs through the heart of the South Side. It is a, 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 was a rails to trail conversion. And it's, I think it's one of the few trails that you'll hear about today that already exist and is often forgotten because when you look at the maps of Chicago, it's always listed as this trail is complete. However, 20 years ago, when our trail was first uh, uh, converted from a railroad uh, line to a to, uh, trail, people, I don't know what the reason was, but no amenities were ever or enhancements were ever installed on the trail. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things that we are in dire need of uh, that many of you are including in your plans today. And we, we, we hope and pray that we can get this done. This is something that's very near and dear to both myself, uh, Peter and Ann. I was born and raised literally three, four blocks away from where the, one of the intersections of the trail. Peter and Ann also live in the, in the community that the trail runs through. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, one of, and one of the other things that I probably should have mentioned on the previous slide, it's also now a connector to the Cal Sag Trail. Um, so what does the trail need now? Well, we, this is a, these are photos from our annual cleanup day. We have we have one to two cleanup days every year, um, but we have a few ideas of some some improvements for safety and enhancements as well. Go ahead to the next slide. So uh, in 2019, Brook Architecture did a, a complete identity and wayfinding plan for us uh, that was funded by CCT. And we were just peachy keen proud when we saw in 20, I believe it was summer of 2021, 
where the mile markers were installed. But if you look at that actual document, if you go ahead and click on the link um, uh, for me, uh, Maggie, and just kind of scroll through the pages, you'll see that there was much, much more to that wayfinding plan than just the mile markers at every half mile. There are sections of the trail uh, that that need directions, and you'll hear me talk about that as we go through this. Um, if the link didn't open up, just go ahead and go to the next slide. Anyone interested in the entire wayfinding plan, uh, Active Trans has a copy of it, as well as we have a copy of it. So this is another piece that was included in the wayfinding plan. So the previous slide showed directional arrows that also had our logo on it. These are uh, branded customized showers because there's portions of the street uh, that CDOT ma manages that if you don't have a guide with you on the trail, you will get lost. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, there's, we also have had a, included in that identity and wayfinding plan, branded locator maps so that it could tell you, well, you're here, like you see on many of the other just trails that you see across the city and across the country. Um, and this is an example of one that was included in that wayfinding plan. Next slide. Uh, and then branded interpretive signs that actually, you know, can give you information and edu education about who Major Taylor is, education about the community and other historical uh, pieces that you see when you travel to many other tourist uh, locations. Um, again, all of these things are included in the wayfinding plan. Uh, go ahead uh, to the next slide. We are Peachy King proud. Uh, no, go back one. We're Peachy King proud that CDOT, Cook County Forest Preserve, and the, Cook the Chicago Park District did work together and they did implement one component of the wayfinding plan, which was using the logo that Brook Architect Firm created for us. And we do have the mile markers installed every half mile, but there are so many other things in that wayfinding plan. So that's one of the things that we'd like to see done is to have the entire wayfinding plan completed. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, one of the other visions that we have is we would like to restore and complete the mural that currently is at 111th Street. We received a quote. I don't, I'm not going to have you click on the um, link, but just know that there is a full quote that was given to us with estimates. If anyone is interested in funding the initiative, you can ask Active Trans for the quote, or you can get it from our organization. But we would like to have this completed. Back in 2019, it was estimated that it would cost about $8,000 to restore that mural and to finish it so that it goes across the entire uh, wall. Um, next slide. Um, there's a, the I-57 overpass. We would like to have a mural installed there. There's We also have an estimated quote for, for that project. Um, it's just the bare steel panels for right now. We would like to have something there that's that's aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Uh, next slide. Uh, rain garden. Now, this is a real concern. Um, between 110th and about 113th, and I, I'm, I'm guesstimating the, the blocks, um, whenever there's a heavy rain, that water sits there for like three to four weeks and becomes a nest for mosquitoes, which is just not... Not a pleasant thing. Plus, the rain garden would beautify the area as well as correct the issue of the drainage issue that's happening there. Uh, next, next slide. Um, we need lights installed from 105th to 107th. There's no lighting in this section. Next slide. Next slide. We would also like at that 111th Street intersection to have a permanent statue or monument of some type at that uh, location. The park district already has a platform installed there. And right now the Chicago uh, Chicago Art Society has been putting a different statue there on Loner each year. We'd like a permanent statue or monument of Major Taylor in that location. Next slide. I'm going fast as I have a lot to go through. There are no water fountains anywhere along the seven and a half miles. That's a vision that we would like to see happen. Go to the next slide. Um, benches for people to sit. Right now there, there aren't any. Next slide. Uh, there's never been any landscaping uh, any, at any portion of the trail other than one year we did plant trees on the far south section. That's something that we would just like to have in our community. Next slide. Um, street repair. Please help us. 
we have been uh, dialing 311 for at least 10, 15 years because this street has been in this condition for a very long time. So please go to the 311 website and please make the pothole request, but not just the pothole re request. There's so many patches that it just needs to be repaid. Next slide. I'm looking at my timing. Um, we also received a grant from CCT that has shovel ready plans for creating an overlook on the Whistler Woods uh, section of the, in, the end of the trail, um, because there's no place for anyone at that at the river spot to just sit and look at the river and if, just, just enjoy watching nature. That estimated cost back in 2019 was 150K um, and the plans are there. You can request them. Uh, next slide. Um, the intersection of 87th and Damon is not very conducive to uh, cyclists, and we would like some improvements to the signal, signaling there. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, we want what one of the things that we want, not just at the 87th and Damon, but also at 119th and Halsted, is we would like to have some fully ramped curbs. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, at the the this is another location where the wayfinding that I talked about earlier is just really critical and important because if you don't have a guide when you get to the to the 91st Street intersection you can get lost and not know how to connect next slide um this is another complex crossing that if you don't have a guide when you get to 95th Street you could get lost and not find your way on the trail next slide 105th and Vincennes is another another intersection that if there's not additional wayfinding, if our wayfinding plan is never installed, you get lost. You have to have a guide to take you on the trail. Otherwise, you never find the entire seven and a half miles. Next slide. Um, this was a recommendation that uh, Peter Taylor had mocked up for us as far as how they could also uh, redirect some of the traffic and, and, and pathways so people don't get lost. Next slide. Um, uh, th this was more about the 105th Vincennes. We can go ahead to the next slide. I'm looking at the, the timer. Uh, the crossing at 115th and Aberdeen, there isn't any traffic awareness or signage that lets people know that, hey, this is a bike path. Um, and so this is a spot that needs some improvement. Bike lanes have been installed since this picture was taken. So there have been some improvements, but we're still asking for more. Next slide. Uh, I talked about the 119th intersection already, that this is just another spot that you get lost um, and the wayfinding is critical and, and, and much need, as well as the, the ramped curves. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, same, go to the next slide. Um, now also, you have to keep in mind, our trail was built in 2000, I think it was 2000, 2001. Um, it's the whole trail, the whole path is just in need of new pavement. Um, there are several sections that look similar to this. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And weeds are growing through the through parts of it. Um, some of the other enhancements that we have, we dream of a, there's a, a Major Taylor Park adjacent to the 119th intersection. There's a vacant lot currently there that is owned by ComEd. We would love for that to be a, a park and, a, and another place uh, to, to just sit and enjoy nature. Next slide. Um, there's an abandoned um, house at 111th Street at the intersection. We'd like that to be replaced with any, either tear it down, build a rain garden, build another garden, a bike shop, coffee shop. Go ahead and click uh, so that they can see the other pictures. Um, but this house, and one more, one more picture, this house has been sitting there with the tree in the roof and abandoned for at least the 10 years that I have been advocating. And so we would like that, that how home we checked it's currently in the Cook County Land Bank we we just if we if we want it to be something beautiful not what you're looking at on the screen um you can see it's adjacent to the trail next slide um there's this is I have this here there's an excel spreadsheet with an itemized list of some of the improvements that are needed with estimated cost if anyone wants to is interested and wants to help us out just I have it active trans has a copy of it as well um next slide I think I did good on timing. And then I want to end with come out on August 26th and ride with us. We will be your guides. We promise you will not get lost because we will stay together. We will uh, we will uh, be your guides. 
Um, it's a tribute to Major Taylor. And every year we always try to we find one to three people in the community that have made a significant difference to our community. And we give honor them with an award. Uh, the ride starts at 9 a.m. The cost is $35. 100% of the, the fees go back into improvements for the trail. Um, there's a QR code. And I think that's my... Um, Yes. Oh, if you uh, if you need to contact us, these are our emails. You can also go to our website to make donations. And that's it. if there's any questions, I think that's where Peter and Anne and myself would all team up. And I think all questions are at the end, right? Right. Yes. The, um, all right. I went so at the much, light Brenda. of speed. Did I stay under ten minutes? You were fantastic. Under 10 minutes. Yeah, you were. Okay. You were great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And truly, this trail and all the trails here deserve their own webinar because I know there's a lot to say and. Yeah. Um, and I bet people would be interested in digging in more, but we'll make sure to send out all of those links that you you shared when we follow up with attendees. And if you can support the Major Taylor Trail or you know someone else who might be interested, please spread the word, share this webinar recording. Um, so thank you again. Um, and next up is uh, Bennett Haller. So actually one sec, Bennett, before I switch to you, I just want to do a quick check on the PowerPoint. I wanted to make sure I didn't um, mess up the order of the slides. So bear with me. Okay, looks good. Okay, one moment. So. I'm going to turn my camera off until Q&A time. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, so with that, um, we have Bennett Haller from the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways. Uh, so Bennett, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Bennett Haller, my official title is Transit Manager with the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways, or DOTH, as we typically like to be called, to, it takes much less time to say. Um, my official, as I say, my official title is transit manager, but I work a lot in bike and transit planning, and I will quickly highlight the bike plan and then quick, and also then get into the schedule for Burnham. Uh, next slide, please. So we just released this plan, uh, first ever countywide bike plan, and it really helps uh, also our coordination with the Cook County Department of Public Health and trying to uh, advance an overall policy roadmap to promote healthy activities such as cycling. Um, clearly in our case, our relationship with the forest preserves is very important as they have a lot of nice trails, the Major Taylor being one of them. Um, and we wanna make sure that those trails are much better integrated into overall bike networks. And I will talk about that a little bit. Um, the county is hard because there are a lot of jurisdictions. It's one thing to create trails in Chicago. It's another thing to create trails that go from Chicago to somewhere else because there's more jurisdictions and often the border itself might feature something challenging like say railroads as is the case with the Burnham Greenway uh, and also the Invest in Cook program is a major way we promote uh, bike projects and fun bike projects throughout uh, the 135 municipalities, 80 park districts and 20 townships, which have some control over rights of way. Next slide, please. Um, the three principles, uh, one is to, to increase everyday cycling that, uh, you know, there are places to park your bike safely. Uh, there are routes you can take to get to various places you want to go um, and supporting commuting and transit and particularly making sure that those are well integrated because hopefully that's the major way you get around is by biking and transit, not by driving. Uh, we really want to focus on the low stress network and trails. All of them are a very important part of that. Uh, they are the best part of the low stress network because because the least stressful place to be is not with cars at all, not near cars, but away from cars and trails provide that opportunity. Uh, and then particularly as it relates to uh, this webinar, we are very keen to support development in South Chicago and the South suburbs of Cook County, largely areas of historic disinvestment uh, with not the same amenities that might exist on say some North side trails. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a lot of data we had to scrub through and unfortunately my major conclusion about data is that it's actually not it's getting worse not better. Uh, Lyft does not share information, for example, on the gender of uh, subscribers anymore. And you can see that uh, there were some change in terms of member rides. There was interesting things happening with the number of women as a proportion of all rides going up slightly, but I don't know after that. Um, 
We have things like Strava, uh, which tell you at least where confident cyclists might want to bike. So it's not unuseful, but it doesn't represent everybody. Uh, and then cellular phone sources of data like Replica uh, are becoming less and less useful over time, in part because uh, people are opting out and the privatization of data is sort of making some of these mass data sources less useful. But we do know something about sort of the typical bike trip. So just want to be clear that we had to create our own data. Uh, we made our own bike route data countywide because that did not previously exist. We also paired that with level of traffic stress data uh, created by the University of Minnesota so we can make judgments at least at a certain level about the level of stress of existing bike routes. We also have uh, very much tried to make sure we know all of the trail and side path projects that are uh, planned by us or by IDOT or by the forest preserves or by any other entity in the Cook County area of which there are many. We also, um, CMAP has a um, greenways and trails uh, shape file that has a whole lot of lines on it, not all of which I think are terribly realistic. So we have a much more discreet list uh, of future trails and side paths we'd like to explore. And then also we've developed a new access tool, hopefully uh, that will come out next year in a simplified version that really prioritizes the challenges in getting to trails because they often have few access points. You can be near a trail, but very far away from being able to bike to it because of various obstacles. Next slide, please. Um, so what are we already doing? Well, uh, this beautiful image is actually showing you something I will talk about a little more. We are actively trying to develop a bridge between the village of Burnham and the Hegwish community of Chicago. We call it the Burnham Multimodal Connector or BMC, which is part of the Burnham Greenway. This is showing you an image looking north and west on Brainerd toward the Hegwish Metro Station, which is served by uh, the South Shore Line. And so it's a, the only NICTI only station in Chicago. Um, and this is showing you the bridge going overhead, which was a real challenge because of all the various uh, things that had to go over to make it happen. But uh, in general, this is an example of the sorts of projects we want to do. Uh, in some cases, we are the only entity that can make these uh, cover these gaps, literally bridge these gaps because of all the organizations you have to talk to to make this real. Next slide, please. So this is what the, as we sort of generally presume the bike network looks today, looking at only the low stress elements. So trails are shown there in brown, side paths in kind of a burnt orange color and low stress bike routes in a sort of beigey color. Uh, but one of the things this is meant to show you very clearly is there are all kinds of gaps. There are not all communities in Chicago even have bike routes. Uh, and also some of those black lines are showing you high stress bike routes, which we are not including in the low stress network, um, but also many suburban communities all have no bike routes whatsoever as well. So, uh, and also with the various dash lines, those are that 10 year horizon with bike trails and side paths. You can see a little bit into the future. So we presume the Cal SAG trail will be complete uh, uh, in, in its entirety in the next 10 years. Uh, we know there's stuff going on west of Avenue O along Burley and other streets, uh, new side paths being developed. I think they're largely done at this point, frankly. And we also envision that the Burnham Multimodal Connector will also be complete in less than 10 years. And I'm going to focus on that a little more specifically very soon. Next slide, please. Um, so this is looking specifically uh, sort of locally at, at the Burnham Multimodal Connector uh, where the gap is. And that's the sort of the, the chunky brown and black line uh, that's connecting between two brown lines. So this will go from uh, Burnham uh, at the south end at State Street, just east of Alice. Uh, that's also where the Cal Sag Trail is supposed to connect to the Burnham Greenway. So that will become a very important nexus uh, for trail systems. It will then go north from there across Burnham um, over uh, a, 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 a spur of the Little Calumet and then ultimately our project is taking over all those railroad tracks there. And then there's an IDNR project in Chicago that will get you all the way up to around 122nd-ish where uh, the Burnham Greenway already exists. Next slide, please. So this is making it a little more explicit about the various elements. The Burnham element is in the light green. Our project is in the red. Uh, and the uh, IDNR project in Chicago is in the darker green. It's a, it's a little over three miles in total length, although it's about a 2.5 mile straight line distance between the two ends, the, the number you all were talking about earlier. Um, and uh, uh, how are these projects moving? Next slide, please. 
Uh, I'm sorry, this is just showing you quickly what the what our bridge is actually doing to get over all those trains. This was really threading the needle uh, to get over Brainerd, to get over the ComEd power lines, uh, not get too close to them and get over those tracks. We also had to get agreement from uh, CRRC, Xinfang America, to go over their little access rail uh, for when they make train cars, that's how they actually get uh, into the rail system is right where uh, our bridge is crossing. And they're okay with it, thank God. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, so here we go. What is the schedule right now? Um, it, um, ooh, actually this didn't get updated, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the, so the IDNR project uh, north, uh, the, which is the north segment, um, uh, right now they are, we are looking to, they are looking for phase one funds. They need to update their phase one partly because they're going around a super fund site uh, north of 126th street, uh, which they have to get around. So uh, that is, uh, they are seeking phase one funding. I, Completion is much more likely in 2026 than 2025, now that I, I know that schedule. Uh, for Village of Burnham, they too have to update their phase one study. Um, that is going to happen this year. Uh, they will likely get into phase two in 2024 20, 20, and 25. Uh, the project itself likely to be completed in 2026. And our own project, um, uh, I was a little optimistic, but I, I, my update is that phase one and phase two is likely to be done in, uh, phase two is likely to be done in 2024 and 2025. The final preliminary design is complete. Uh, construction is likely to take place in 2026, 2027. And next slide, please. That's my story, thank you. Super, thanks so much, Bennett. Um, and now I'd like to pass it over to Boeza Tagi from Grow, Grow Greater Englewood. Um, who will be sharing about the Englewood Nature Trail. Thank you, Maggie, and hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be on this panel alongside some incredible and very necessary projects happening throughout our city. So as mentioned, my name is Bueza Itaji, and I work with Grow Greater Englewood. We are a nonprofit social enterprise that works on a lot of different projects, activations, and programs focused on repurposing some vacant land within our community into vibrant, thriving community spaces centering around nature. And my role specifically is to help to steward the Inglewood Nature Trail Project and the Agro Eco District, which I will talk a bit more about. Next slide, please. So our trail is about 1.75 miles long. It runs east to west, as far east as Low, so just east of Halstead, and then as far west as Winchester, which is just before Damon. So it's a, a pretty decent stretch, and we are actually seated between two of the largest intermodal yards in the country, CSX on the western end, and then Norfolk Southern on the east. And our trail used to be used for light manufacturing throughout the neighborhood and has been vacant since about the 1960s. So in that time, there have been a lot of conversations, visioning sessions, and just co community conversations to think of how this space could be repurposed and reutilized, but specifically, as a way to connect a growing network of farms, gardens, and just food businesses throughout the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So the agro eco district is what we're calling the larger area of land around the trail. So think of the trail itself as more of the spine connecting the district, but then there is still a, a immense amount of vacant land surrounding the trail. So an agro eco district is a newer maybe newer term that's not used as much, but it's really defined as a space in which there are different activations and, um, pr and practices being used to really focus on the ecology of the environment. Because of the long manufacturing and train history in our area, there is contamination in the space. And we are still going through soil testing, but we understand that this project has the potential to really heal the land and correct a lot of the environmental and, and racial harm as well that has been inflicted on our community. So that's kind of the, the core piece of that with the agroeco district. Next slide, please. 
And with that, though, we also realized that our trail sits in the middle of a neighborhood that has experienced a lot of disinvestment and neglect for generation for decades. So we want to make sure that as we are um, going through the process of redeveloping this space, and we're still very early in the process, which I will speak to a bit later, we are centering core drivers in the process. So those four, there are more than four at this point, but these are kind of the main four. First, anti-displacement. We want to make sure that whatever investment and um, redevelopment comes from this trail is something that neighborhood residents, current residents are able to benefit from both financially as well as just environmentally. So we want to make sure that we're securing and stabilizing the homeowners within the community as well as folks who are not homeowners and making sure there are pathways for them to be homeowners should they choose. Also environmental quality, as I mentioned, we want to try to sequester and really absorb a lot of that toxicity and contamination that's in the soil and revitalize and make the space a beautiful nature area. Community stewardship, we are looking at different models where community can control the space and run the park and have full deciding agency over programming and potentially funding sources as well. And then workforce development is another big piece. We realize that there is a lot of um, employment potential within this project from construction to maintenance to landscaping. And we want those jobs to be given priority to current Inglewood neighbor residents. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of a historical timeline. Our current timeline looks a bit different, but just this frames that this has been a, an ongoing long process since about 2009 with the new era vision plan in which this space as well as others in the area were looked at and thought of how they can fit into a larger vision of repurposing and reinvesting in the area. Uh, the name shifted around 2017. We started to call it the Inglewood Line, and we had many community conversations and meetings, both with the city as well as with our community partners to see how the space could be best repurposed for our needs. And then today we're framing it as the Inglewood Nature Trail in the Agro Eco District. And we have come a long way. We've received, well, our budget, our goal is to receive about $75 million for this project. And we are roughly at about 40 million, which is tremendous. And our funding sources thus far have been from the RAISE grant, which is a federal transportation grant. We also received money from Governor Pritzker and then from former Mayor Lightfoot's administration as well. So it's exciting to see that we've been consistent, we've been persistent, and finally the funding is coming for us to be able to do the work that we know is so crucial for our community. Next slide, please. I forgot to time myself, so I'm just going to go a bit quickly through this part, although I feel like it's the most important. But we are, are framing this as a project that centers Black culture and really centers the beauty of our community. So we are, thank you, we are focused on rebuilding Black spaces, creating the space that connects existing parks. So we have Lindblom, Hermitage, and Moran Park within the Agro Eco District. And we want to make sure that there's intersection and communication between the trail and the parks, creating safer spaces for folks to gather. Next slide, please. We also are adamant at community being the leading voice and the leading uh, experts in this process. So we, at this point, have had formally eight community meetings in partnership with DPD, Department of Planning and Development, CDOT, as well as Gensler, which is an architecture firm that's working with us on the project and Grow Greater Inglewood to make sure that we're coming together to get full input from folks on how they would best use the space, as well as how they would best uh, want to see the space to continue to grow. Next slide. And 
also most importantly, I say every piece is the most important, but most importantly, we want to create a community benefits compact so that there are set agreements that new potential businesses have to agree to before entering into the community to make sure that we are not displacing folks. We're adding to this agro eco district centering nature and community and that we are inviting businesses from within the community as well as some externally who will provide employment for current residents. So that's that's an ongoing process that we're newly into, but we will be sharing the community benefits compact, hopefully by the fall. Next slide, please. In this slide, we have, once it's shared out, there are links to a lot of documents and reports and studies that we've conducted over the last 10 or so years. So if anyone wants to check that out, that is there. And I really could speak on this for hours because there are many pieces that it's it's hard to condense into a 10 minute presentation, but I encourage everyone to come and visit us this summer. We have some activations along the trail, including our community market that's held every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that's on 58th and Halstead. And I can share a link in the chat that can be shared with the attendees as well with our page our website that has more about the agro eco district and nature trail. And with that, I will, I think there's one more slide. Yes, I will turn it back to you, Maggie, and thank you all. All right, thanks so much, Boisa. Um, exciting to see what you all have been accomplishing over the last many years. And um, we'll, and this is again, just a teaser. So um, yeah, again, there's a lot, a lot here and we'll be sure to send out um, these links and um, so people can follow up with more, more information. Um, and now, last but not least, we have John Adams from the Bronzeville Trail Development Project. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome all of you who have joined this webinar. Uh, we're honored to uh, tell you about the Bronzeville Trail Development Project. Uh, kudos to my colleagues who are on this uh, panel who are part of this webinar. You're just doing amazing work. Um, uh, Brenda knows that Major Taylor Trail is a special place in my heart and that I live a half a block from the Major Taylor Trail. So I've been on that trail uh, from its uh, uh, genesis, from its very beginning. And uh, Breeza is just doing just an incredible job. Uh, and, and the Inglewood Project is certainly indicative how uh, these projects can become a lot more than just you know uh, advocating for transportation or a bike trail and uh, we with the Brownsville Trail Task Force uh, literally see them as our big brother big sister and uh, try to emulate as much of what they do as we possibly can uh, so with that uh, please go to the next slide and uh, since everyone is going to get this uh, you know who I am kindly go that so this this mural is at uh, King Drive, so I just wanted to mention that to you, right at uh, 40th and King Drive. Next slide, please. So, uh, as you can imagine, and you've heard a lot of this uh, in all the presentations in terms of what missions and goals are, and you're going to you're going to receive this document. So, let's go to the next slide. Um, we want to share with you uh, our our team that's been working on this project. Um, uh, and and they've just been amazing and has just have really been generous uh, and given us a lot of in-kind support. Uh, Moody Nolan, uh, Maria Villalobos, Hernandez Botanical Garden, uh, Smith Group, uh, the whole Smith Group team, both here in Chicago and uh, in Detroit and infrastructure engineering uh, have just been amazing with the in-kind support that they've given us. Uh, next slide, kindly. So, um, so early on, we received this map from the city of Chicago, and this is essentially the preliminary study area. Um, and so I, I wanted you to certainly become familiar with the, well, where we're talking about the Bronzeville Trail. It's, it's the remnants of the old uh, stockyard line. And I'm gonna talk about that some more. Uh, I just want you to have a vision where this uh, uh, embankment is located, which essentially runs east to west, 
now 40th Street, and then it begins to veer towards 41st Street. One of the unique features of our project is that uh, it's going to connect the community and even communities west of the Dan Ryan to the uh, 41st Street pedestrian bridge and to the lakefront accordingly. Next slide. So uh, certainly, you know, we, we, we have architects and engineers associated with our project and needless to say, they're the ones who kind of prepared this slide. We have no clue. I mean, we are strictly a grassroots organization, a bunch of people who came together, a bunch of stakeholders, as I like to describe, three types of stakeholders, residential, uh, institutional, and people like myself, uh, which I brand as a legacy stakeholder people who, who grew up, lived in Bronzeville, educated in Bronzeville, uh, bought their first homes in Bronzeville, perhaps businesses in Bronzeville. So although they may not be there now, they're vested and, and certainly wish nothing but the best for the Bronzeville community. Um, with a little bit of luck, we hope to have our structure completed by 2028. Next slide. So this really begins uh, uh, just a, a story about uh, not only the project, but uh, some of the things we've uncovered as we began to embark upon this project. Next slide, please. And and certainly, uh, there's no greater historic community in this country than the Bronzeville community. And uh, uh, we like to uh, banter with our uh, friends and out of Harlem in New York, uh, who think uh, you know Harlem is the stuff. And I like to use another word than stuff. But uh, we remind them that Bronzeville really is the stuff. And, uh, and when I get ready to drop the mic, I always remind them that the first uh, African-American uh, uh, since post-Reconstruction uh, uh, from 1901 through 1928, uh, where there were 28 years with no African-American in, in the United States Congress, that the first African-American uh, elected in, 20, in 1928 Eight and sworn in 1929 was Oscar the Priest uh, from the Brownsville community. So, so this timeline actually, you know, begins to tell a story about uh, some of the unique aspects uh, of our project. And so it really begins with the Chicago Union Stockyard, which was formed in 1865 and uh, petitioned the city 1882 to uh, lay, a, lay a rail line uh, a grade level from the stockyards to all the intermodals and, and exchanges and pardon me if, if I'm not exact with the language, but I think you know what I'm referring to, how the trains would intersect and then uh, commerce and uh, and that line was industrial and commercial. It was not a passenger line, but it's it was the line, uh, uh, the, the project that we intend to repurpose is a remnants of the old stockyard line, which literally help propel Chicago to become the city that we celebrate today, uh, now the third largest city in this country. And uh, the meat processing industry was a big part of that. Um, uh, those of us who on this uh, in this webinar are old enough certainly uh, have eaten uh, armor meats and swift meats and all the other uh, meat processing magnets that uh, uh, became uh, major players in philanthropy and in developing the city of Chicago. So, so that happened in the late 1800s. Uh, in uh, 1903, the city council voted that that rail line needed to run on an embankment because it was killing too many people. The trains were killing too many people, not the rail line, the trains. And so the embankment opened in 1907. And from that time, um, uh, it still was pretty much commercial and industrial running between the stockyards and, and other uh, uh, train lines that were going north, south, or east, west, uh, transferring goods and produce as well as livestock. But in 1947, the CTA began to operate the uh, Kimwood L line. And, and that's how the city received the inventory. And so the city still calls it the uh, Kimwood L line. Uh, certainly, we are, are rebranding it to the Bronzeville Trail. And so it operated for 10 years, essentially, from 1947 to 1957, uh, when the line terminated. And there's a lot of reasons given for that uh, termination. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we began to realize as uh, uh, 
residents of the Brownsville community, stakeholders of the Brownsville community, is that the city of Chicago abandoned our community since 1957 and just simply left a uh, municipal asset unattended um, for over 60, 65 years at that point. And so um, uh, we take that very serious and we implore all of our elected officials that um, as, we, as we've talked about this investment and neglect, uh, that uh, embam, uh, uh, the abandoned rail embankment is really the poster child of neglect and that it's been abandoned for over 65 years. So i like to stop, go to the next slide, please. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the landmarks and uh, uh, pardon me, would you kind of go back um, uh, to the previous slide? I wanna point out uh, some key landmarks. Uh, certainly one is the Wabash YMCA and that should be here. Uh, literally, it's it's like the Ellis Island of the Black migration, um, and uh, and also uh, at the Wabash YMCA, uh, Major Taylor, uh, which uh, you know, I'll be glad to tell you a lot more about. It's not the purpose of this webinar, but he moved to the Wabash Y in 1930, and that's where he resided when uh, he made his transition in 1932. And so we take a lot of pride in the fact that this rail embankment is literally two blocks from the Wabash YMCA. So please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a map that uh, marks uh, many of the churches and landmarks, uh, again, that are in the Bronzeville community. Bronzeville is legendary. I mean, there's, uh, you know, uh, books. Uh, certainly there's the uh, New Saba Museum, which is dedicated to Black history, the oldest museum in the country dedicated to Black history. We, there's more than you could digest learning about uh, all the history of, of Bronzeville and all the prominent people and institutions that came from that community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's the, the slide actually I was thinking of uh, that really points to some of the key landmarks across the top. I mentioned Wabash Y, the home of Ida B. Wells is within walking distance. A World War I monument. Uh, is at 35th and King Drive, uh, Vic, called Victory Monument. There's a great northern migration statue right on King Drive, approximately 25th Street. Some of you might be familiar with the Ida B. Wells Monument that uh, was recently constructed just a couple of years ago. And then in the lower half of the screen, uh, uh, boy, there is holy ground uh, identified as number six, uh, literally Robert's Temple. And for those of you who don't know, Robert's Temple uh, was the church, Church of God in Christ, where the open casket of Emmett Till uh, was viewed, uh, literally is considered uh, the event that ignited the modern day civil rights movement. Uh, Robert's Temple is less than 50 feet from the uh, abandoned Kenwood L. Embankment. Um, some other key landmarks that are noted, uh, but I wanna point out to you number seven, and, and we were told by Commissioner Maurice Cox that this was bound to happen. And uh, the rendition of number seven actually comes from another development that uh, right, is right up against our embankment, the Brownsville Trail Embankment, uh, and that project is the Hot House. Well, they included several renditions, uh, uh, visioning statements of how their project will interface with the Brownsville Trail. And so this is just one of them. Uh, and so it's just amazing the impact that we know this uh, project is going to have on the Brownsville community. Um, besides construction costs, next slide, please, um, where, well, which I'll get into in more detail. Uh, next slide. Uh, the city uh, conducted a feasibility study on the project. Uh, these are the existing conditions. Next slide, slide please. This is our team visiting the Bloomingdale Trail. Um, our project, just by its physical nature, is gonna resemble the Bloomingdale Trail, but certainly, you know, given the history of Brownsville, that alone will make it much different. But the very fact that it's a rail to trail conversion of an abandoned rail line uh, is how we're very similar to the Bloomingdale Trail. And so this is the very first uh, activity that, that our board conducted. Uh, the Brownsville Trail Task Force was founded in September 2020. Uh, we spent uh, the next 12 months uh, recruiting board members, developing a consulting team, 
And in September 2021, uh, we took a tour of the Bloomingdale Trail. Next slide. Uh, we were fortunate to be uh, listed by Mayor Washington and the Department of Planning uh, in the DPD March 31 uh, Trails and Quarters plan for the city of Chicago. And we were listed, identified as a Kenwood Embankment, that's us, the Brownsville Trail. Uh, and we were listed as one that have, as having potential. Uh, that's March 31st, 2022, excuse me. Uh, next slide. So, uh, and, and at that point, it just seemed like uh, uh, we were on a roll. Uh, the very next month, CCT awarded us a planning grant. Uh, this talks about that grant. That was April of 2022. Next slide, please. And uh, and again, this is sort of a, a, th a thumbnail sketch of, of, of what took place during that grant period. Uh, we had stakeholder meetings, we did workshops, and uh, we produced a final report of, on for CCT in February of 2023. Uh, we had open houses and, and public meetings that was sponsored by the city of Chicago, December of 2022. Next slide. So once again, um, uh, and this is just so amazing, and that's and this is where we really admire uh, the work that's taking place with the Inglewood project. Uh, we too have developed some companion projects, and we've developed a number of different uh, community engagement opportunities. So uh, we took a, a walk again at the Bloomingdale Trail site. Uh, we had a minister's breakfast to brief local clergy about our project. We had a community luncheon where we gave some awards. Uh, we did some more community engagement where we, had, where we had some live entertainment. We branded that Bronzeville Night Live. And then, as I mentioned, we had the community workshops. Next slide. So we produced a pamphlet uh, for people who attended the workshops so that they have a better idea of the, the trail, its impact, the way it looks today, uh, some visions of other trails, as well as a map. Next slide. Uh, These are some photos from the walk shop. Uh, literally in real time, um, we learned that uh, President Tony Preckwinkle was conducting a meeting uh, nearby, and uh, uh, as well as Commissioner Bill Lowry, as you can see in the photo. And we invited them to meet our group who were engaged in the walk shop. And uh, uh, we're very grateful that they took the time to stop by, say hello to our group. Uh, both President Preckwinkle and uh, Commissioner Lowry. Next slide. Here again is another uh, map of, uh, of some of schools and uh, uh, religious institutions uh, that are within the development quarter of the Bronzeville Trail. Um, and to the west of, uh, you see State Street, and you certainly see Roberts Temple labeled there. Uh, there's a street, uh, some of you may know, uh, called Root Street. Uh, essentially, it goes down uh, uh, 40th Street in Chicago. And it goes, and there's an overpass uh, uh, over the Dan Ryan that connects the western uh, side of the Dan Ryan, that western community, to the eastern community. There's, there's got to be more history to that street as it, the street runs right into the Chicago Union Stockyards. I'm telling you about it to uh, let you know that uh, our trail is going to connect uh, communities. It's going to connect uh, the lakefront uh, and people who live west of the Dan Ryan and Bridgeport, uh, back of the Yards community. They'll be able to access the uh, lakefront bike trail uh, via the Brownsville Trail. And, uh, and that's very important. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the December meeting where uh, representatives from the National Park Service attended uh, a lot of information, visioning uh, about the project uh, uh, was presented as well as the findings, next slide, of the feasibility study. And essentially the study of uh, uh, the consultants uh, looked at three options. One, doing nothing, but that was still gonna cost uh, millions of dollars because of the deferred maintenance on the embankment. Uh, second option was to just tear it all down. And as it turned out, the engineers concluded that to demolish it would uh, cost more than to repurpose it. And certainly that's why we're here because we've been the advocates to repurpose that abandoned rail embankment to a walking, running and biking trail. Uh, next slide. 
here's uh, this concludes uh, the presentation about the Bronzeville Trail. This is a, a blown up, a full page uh, presentation of of the hot house and how they envision the hot house is going to interface with the Bronzeville Trail. And so, uh, uh, Commissioner Cox, if I didn't mention this earlier, said that uh, our project is probably going to induce over a billion dollars of investment in the Brazil community. And you can see to the left of this rendition, that is the green line. And so we also expect that there'll be a connection between the uh, CTA green line and the Brazil trail. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for uh, sticking around if you did to hear the presentation about the Brazil trail. And certainly I'll stay on to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, go, go ahead, Alex. I was just gonna say, we uh, went through all the questions already in the Q&A, so there are no questions for anybody to answer. Um, so thank you. Uh, we gave uh, everybody enough time. Hopefully, we wish we could have gave everybody a little bit more time to speak on their trails. There's so much to go on forward, but thank you everybody for joining us, staying on a little bit later. Uh, continue following up at our next trail webinar series events and Maggie go for it if you want to say final words yeah no thank thank you all to our presenters you're you're all incredibly inspiring and and we hope um we hope all of you on the webinar can help uh support all the great work that everyone is doing and thank you all so much thank you for having me thank yeah, you thank you to Active Trance you've been a wonderful partner and uh so I don't know how we would forge ahead without you in our ear, giving us advice, sage advice on how we can move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.